Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, all. My name is Jennifer, and I am an alcoholic. I've been kept sober since December 5th of 92, and that's my miracle, and the Legacy Group in Plano, Texas is my home group, and it is an honor and a privilege to get to be here. I love these weekends. I love these weekends. I mean, I like hearing a good talk. But um, for those of us who, who share a talk or a pitch or a lead or whatever you call it, wherever you are, um, 45 minutes of, the, of it kind of stays the same. And there's, there's that last part that's different. But with the steps, for those of us who are in it all the time, the, it, the information we get to share and the things we get to experience, for me at least, changes from, from talk to talk. And, uh, and it's... Really nice to have these little hints from Heloise that you get to take home to your sponsees. They hate it. I love it. Um, Because I'm like, I got a whole new way to look at six and seven or something different we're going to write about on eight. And so I love that because I, um, the sponsor who was my sponsor for for the majority of my sobriety was a scholar of the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous. She was always finding something new. She was always looking at new words or a new angle or a new definition. Um, and, uh, and so she kept it fresh for us because I wrote a lot of inventories, a lot of inventories because I was unwilling to do a 10th step. And so, um, I just kept going back to four, you know, I would go four through nine, except for paying back the money, four through nine, don't pay back the money, four through nine, don't pay back the money, four through nine, don't pay back the money. And uh, if you'll just sit on nine long enough, you'll slide right back down to one if you don't drink. So, uh, that's what kept happening to me as I kept sliding back to one and, and in sobriety over and over and over again, uh, calling my sponsor crying, saying it hurts, it all hurts, it's all bad, you know, and uh, she'd say, sounds like the first step to me, and off we go again, going through the literature. Uh, I like to take a run and start at four and five, but I, there's a bunch of meat in the fourth step, so I don't want to get too caught up in, in my drunk because you've heard beautiful st- first step stories to get to this point, Um I'll just tell you, I was a daily drinker and a daily drunk. I came from two school teachers who didn't drink, which is a horrible place for a baby alcoholic to grow up. I mean, it's awful. Uh, I got this one younger sister who was a virgin when she got married, and um, and um, she was a missionary. She was a missionary. I was a cocktail waitress in a pool hall. My, my sister's working for Jesus. So... Um, Fantastic. Uh, we both were doing outreach, if you know what I mean. But um, we'll get to that part of the inventory later. Um, but I um, and I'm I'm a drinker and a driver because I got places to go. You know, I, I talk myself into situations I need to get out of, and you don't understand me. And I've got to I've got to take my show on the road. I was always a bar drinker, uh, pretty much from the beginning. Um, well, I started out a closet drinker. I had my first drink in a, in a closet. Um, but after that, I discovered bars, and I loved them. And um, when I was 19 years old, I had a, a, a friend who, who passed out on his back, drunk, and asphyxiated on his own vomit. And um, I don't, until I, somebody took me through the book, I didn't realize that that was a turning point for me. And I stopped drinking at home, and I stopped drinking alone because I'm that kind of drunk. And I didn't ever verbalize it, but it was when somebody took me through the book that I realized that was one of the reasons I connected so heavily with being in a bar, because I felt I was supervised. And um, and every night I was turning my will and my life over the care of anybody who would have it. because I, if I wasn't done, I wasn't done, and I didn't have it at my house, and so we did a little exchange. I wasn't a prostitute per se, Um, because prostitutes apparently made money. Uh, I'll just do it for three curves lot. And uh, so, God, I hope my mother never hears this talk. But um, that's just the kind of girl that I was. And um, on November 19th of 1992, I got a felony DWI. Uh, 
drinking and driving is kind of one of my hobbies, and uh, I'm not good at it. And uh, and I got caught, and the only thing that was different that day was that um, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. That is not my last drunk. Uh, I did get drunk one more time to prove that I would drink whether I wanted to or not. I went to a bar to go talk to somebody about my legal problems, because that's where the great legal minds of our time hang out. Some of my favorite criminals are in a bar today, and uh, so I was going to talk to him about my legal problems. I was not going to drink that day. And yet, at some point, there were drinks in front of me, and at some point, I drank them. And I didn't decide to, as a matter of fact, the glasses were empty before I realized I had done it. That's the kind of drunk I am. I don't have to pray on it. I don't have to make a decision. There's no violins going, Duh. you know, it's just, oh, I did it again. Oops, I did it again. And, um, but that's when I knew I would drink whether I wanted to or not. And that's when I stumbled into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and lucky for me, that night Alcoholics Anonymous brought its best to me. Um, I was sitting in a room full of people. I'd been trying for 10 days to get to a meeting. Um, it was just so inconvenient when you're crazy and terrified. Um, I would drive around the group. Do we have any orbiters? I'm a big orbiter. I've been orbiting Al-Anon for about 10 years. I haven't actually made it to a meeting, but I'm so close. Um, but I was driving around this AA group and, um, one night I accidentally got there at meeting time, which I had not intended, and uh, I started to get out of the car, and then my alkalogic kicked in, and I thought, wait a minute, I don't have an AA book. I can't be wandering rolling up into an AA meeting without the AA book. So, y'all, I got in my car, left the group where the AA books live <laughs> to go on a quest for the AA books. So I went to the Barnes and Noble and um, they have AA books there. They are expensive. I mean, this was 1992, so they were probably $4.49 or something. And I was not flush. And uh, so I decided that seemed like a pretty huge investment in something that I thought was a long shot to start with. So I went to the half price books. They got them there too. But the problem is half price books, uh, big books, have highlighting them in them. And you know you don't have a good copy if it wound up at half-price books. Uh, I don't really want somebody's willy-nilly highlighting influencing my opinions of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. So I wind up on this, you know, like four-day quest to find a clean copy of Alcoholics Anonymous at the half-price books, and then I got to read it before I go to the meeting so you don't think I'm dumb. And um, and that's when I got drunk. So um, so by the time I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was suicidal. I was living at home with my parents. I had brought alcoholism home to them, and I was holding them emotionally hostage. I was telling myself the lies that alcoholics tell themselves, like I'm not hurting anybody. They don't know how I'm living anyway. And the truth is that these two little school teachers are being held hostage by a daughter who's coming home at 3 in the morning, wasted out of her mind, bouncing off their cabinets. Oh, by the way, I'm the designated weeper. I have cried through every talk. I'm like, what? why do I put on makeup when I'm just going to weep it off? Um, which is one of the reasons I love to drink. It sort of duct taped me together. <laughs> and then uh, take that away from me, and I'm just sobbing through the whole thing. We're just cleaning out places God's going to move into. And <laughs> just beautiful. You know, I'm just losing it. So, sorry, this is very stream of consciousness. You're just going to have to roll with me. Um, so I'm living with these people and, uh, and, uh, my parents, yeah, those people. And, uh, and they're watching me die one day at a time and they're afraid to say anything because I've become so erratic that the chances are I'm going to flip them off and, you know, squeal out of the driveway. And, and they're so afraid of that phone call in the middle of the night that they would rather I die in their home than be out on the streets doing whatever it is I'm doing. And they're not confronting me about anything because they don't know what to do. This is not the life they live. This is not the way they raised me to be. This is not what they wanted for their daughter. And they are terrified. And I can't see it. I can't see it because I am so consumed by self. I have no idea. 
And I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I sat as close to the door as humanly possible, because that's what noobs do. You know, we just sit and twitch. <laughs> back the, no offense to anybody who happens to be sitting in the back, but that's what I did. I, You know, I sat in the back, and I twitched, and um, and uh, thinking I'm slick. And uh, they were all sitting out. At, I act like the group I got sober at was huge. It was not. It was a tiny little greenhouse in Plano, and uh, but everybody was sitting down at this end of the room, and I was sitting way back there. And right before the meeting started, uh, somebody said, "Hey, don't why don't you come sit with us? There's a chair right here." And I believe my recovery began when I moved from the chair I I chose next to the door into the circle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I became a part of, and I began to do it somebody else's way. And I didn't recognize it in the moment. As a matter of fact, I didn't recognize it for years. But I believe that's when it began, was when I surrendered my idea and started trying yours. I came into AA, and I fell in love with you at once. Before I had a God of my understanding, I had you. I had your stories, and I don't ever want to forget that that is how the newcomer connects. It is not philosophically. It is not theoretically it is not necessarily through the language of the book alcoholics anonymous it is through our stories that we connect first that is how you fed me god and you were better than anything on tv you know that's why i kept coming back because it was oh there was drama you know you had to show up to see if chris and richard broke up or did frank get a job or you know the continuing saga of alcoholics anonymous today's episode um God, I love, I mean, I loved it. I loved it and you were kind to me. What else did I need, you know? But if you come to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, first off, because I had nothing else to do um, except listen to my brain, which was eating my face off anyway, um, <laughs> then, then they start, you know, they get on it like, come to the women's meeting, come to the women's meeting. Whoa, I don't need any women. Uh <laughs> Just saying, I don't like you one-on-one. -on -one. I certainly don't need a gaggle or a pack. And uh, you women in AA travel in herds. I've seen you. And, uh, and you're so much more put together than I am. You know, y'all are nice ladies, and I'm, I'm not any of those things. And, and I just, I feel so afraid. I, you know, I'm sucking up and terrified and defiant and all of that all in one big weeping package and um i went to the women's meeting and i stalked the sponsor in my first meeting um the lady who chaired the meeting I, she really impressed me she became my first aa bff she had on a biker jacket and a skirt and chuck taylor's and she could say god and the f word all in the same sentence <laughs> And I sat in that meeting and thought, if they can teach her to hug, they might be able to do something with me. And, um, but she said that the first time she saw her sponsor, she knew. This is all the information I have about finding a sponsor. Do, 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 do. You know, I'm just sitting in a meeting trying to know. <laughs> now, um, it's important, probably an important detail to tell you what it looked like when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was kind of rocking an androgynous vibe. I had uh, short hair, some sweats I bought in the men's department of the Walmart, boys' shoes, a ball cap. Uh, I didn't wear makeup, and I wept all the time. They didn't know what it was, but it wept a lot. And so I'm looking a little rough, and I'm staring down the women in the meeting, looking for the one. <laughs> This wasn't going very well, so I went to the Denny's recovery unit to gather more information. <laughs> I said, look, I've been stalking a sponsor, and I'm not finding anybody. And they said, oh, oh, sorry. You need to find someone you can relate to, and then you ask her to do what she did, and, uh, and then you'll, your life will begin to change. So now I'm in a meeting looking for the one, listening for someone I can relate to. I'm new, I'm crazy, I'm drinking about three pots of coffee in an evening. I had my first cup of coffee at my very first meeting. I probably could have drank longer if I'd known about coffee, but I just did what you did. You went and got styrofoam cups, I went and got styrofoam cups, you know, and so I'm just drinking coffee all night long. So I'm up, I'm twitching, I'm butching, I'm staring at women in the meeting, and uh, 
<laughs> First woman I uh, I asked to be my sponsor, was, uh, she talked like a BB in a can. Just what the, what the, what the, I was like, there she is. <laughs> it's the mothership. And uh, I left over furniture to ask her to be my sponsor. And um, she agreed. And I said, how long have you been sober? And she said, four days. <laughs> Uh, I said, I got something like three weeks. Maybe I should be your sponsor. And, uh, so the finding someone I could relate to plan wasn't going that well. So I go back to the Denny's recovery unit. I gather more information. And they said, find someone who has what you want and ask them to teach you to do what they do. So I'm looking for someone who has what I want. Y'all, the most I thought I could ever ask of Alcoholics Anonymous was that I could be turned into a nice lady. So all I'm looking for in AA is a nice lady, and I found her. Oh, I had another criteria. That's not true. I had another criteria. There was a, a line of sponsorship in my home group where all the men did their um, fist steps on camping trips. I was not in great shape for camping. So I thought we all did our fist steps on camping trips. Um, that's the thing that happens in meetings. When you're getting all your information from meetings, I think, oh, camping trip equals fist step. And so I got to find a sponsor who is not going to make me do a nature hike. So my first sponsor is roughly this size. Um, she had her nails done. She had her hair done. She had a laugh that shook the walls of the group. You always knew when she was there. And she called me precious. And I hadn't been precious in a really long time. And I asked that lady to be my sponsor, and she agreed. I asked her on the day her puppy died, so her um, defenses were down. And, um, <laughs> and she agreed to be my sponsor. And the truth was, she hadn't worked all 12 steps. She'd been sober multiple years, and there were some steps she was unwilling to do. There were also some steps that nobody had shown her how to do out of the book. I know that now, but I'll tell you I was sober because she sponsored me. She gave me things to do. She made me go get pick up Janet from another planet, which is an amazing story that I do not have time to tell. But I was toting this wackadoo back and forth the meetings, and uh, <laughs> she was special. And... Um, Anyway, so, uh, you know, she gave me things to do, and we worked the steps that she knew how to, how to work, and, and when we got to the fourth step, I did 137 pages of resentments with only three columns. I didn't write about fear, and I didn't write about sex, because she didn't know you were supposed to. She hadn't done it either. I did not know that until later, after I worked the steps out of the book, I went back to that group and began to work with some of the women I got sober with, and I discovered that they had done inventories in exactly the same way. But what happened with me is that as a result of uh, doing an incomplete, in I believe, all of this is filtered through my perception, I believe as a result of not doing the fear and the sex inventory, I didn't have, I was not armed with facts about myself. I waited a year before I went on a date. That's what my sponsor told me to do. I'd like to claim virtue. I'll also tell you that the people who asked me in that first year were super twitchers. And um, like I can work with a little twitching, but they were the super twitchers. And, uh, and I didn't date in my first year until I had that solid brass coin. And, um, but my first sober date, I went out with a guy who'd been going to my home group. He had a sponsor. He had enough time sober. He said he was working the steps, and he asked me out on a date. And my sponsor had said, I want you to be really careful with that guy. I don't know why, but I think you need to be really careful. And she didn't know him like I knew him. Because he said all the things I needed to hear, and that's all you really got to do with me. I don't have very high standards. And we, be, we went out on this date, and uh, it was super romantic. He pulled out all the stops. We went to the bowling alley. <laughs> And we shot pool, and um, and about halfway into the evening, he said he was uncomfortable because there was alcohol around us, and I didn't want to jeopardize his sobriety, and he asked if we could just go watch a movie. <laughs> but I was sober, and he was sober, and I had a sponsor, and he had a sponsor, and I had work steps, and he had work steps, and I knew what the plan was, and I was not going to, I was not going to do it like I had always done it. 
I, I simply, and I swear to you on the big book, I only went to his house because he said he was worried about drinking and we were having a nice evening. I had no intention of going any further. We were sitting on his couch and things began to happen. And I got up and I said, I've got to go. And he said, no, 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 don't do that. And I said, I'm not ready for this. I don't want to go there. I can't. I really can't. And he said, okay. And I sat back down. And within a few minutes, things got hot and heavy. And I got up and I said, I can't. I, I, I really, I cannot stay. I've got to go home. And he said, no, no, just finish the movie. I promise. I'll keep my hands to myself. I didn't have the opportunity to leave the third time. And while there are many things in my inventory that are very confusing, that night there was no confusion about consent. I had not consented. And this is my first date sober. And I go back to my home group, and I've got a secret. See, I don't want to tell my sponsor because she had warned me about that man, and I had thought that my relationship with God, with God was going to give me enough something to act or react differently than I had. And, um, and that man continues to come to those meetings and he continues to sit across the room from me and I'm coming out of my skin because I don't want to drink and I don't want to leave, but I don't think I can hold this in for much longer. I had a guy friend in AA and, um, he had been looking out for me since my first day. He was not trying anything. I wanted him to, but he didn't, um, and he was a fine member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he saw that I wasn't doing well. And one night he pulled me aside and he asked what was going on, and I told him. And I didn't tell him because I needed to tell that secret. I told him because I wanted him to beat the guy up and make sure that he never came back to Alcoholics Anonymous again. But what my friend Danny did was he said, you are in trouble and you are on thin ice and you have got to find a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous that you can talk to. You need to do an inventory immediately because there is no reason for you to drink over this. You do not have to drink over this, but you won't be able to if you don't get help immediately. Coincidentally, I had been going to this meeting to carry the message. I thought it was the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was really AA tapes that I was regurgitating in my own way. And there was a lady there who had had a radar on me. Just, you know how they are. And she honed in. You know, I have a year and a month or something spectacular. And um, But there are women in the room with less than 10 years of sobriety. And this hooker has nothing but the crosshairs on me, you know. She's just straight up, because I'm squirming in the meeting. I don't know if you've noticed, but I like to share. So I'm squirming, so they'll call at me. And I spew my message of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, uh, ish. And, um, and she doesn't even wait for anybody dumber than me to share. Man, she doesn't wait to be called on. It seemed like she had a little big book, whips, like, strapped to her leg, like in a holster, just, whew. And, um... <laughs> You know them, you know, and they could flip right to that page. Like, oh, hey, right here on 23, it says, bup, 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 bup. man, I couldn't stand her. I couldn't stand her. She made me look like an idiot every single time. She knew a secret. She knew a promise. So one night after the meeting, she came up to me and she said, what step are you on? Like that. I mean, maybe not like that. That's what I saw. <laughs> what step are you on? And uh, I told her what I thought was the truth. I was on eight and a half. <laughs> the truth was I'd done a teeny bit of four, no five. I mean, teeny bit of four, shared that part in five, slept through six and seven, had a list of ex-boyfriends that I thought I might want to see again. That's eight. <laughs> And my sponsor hadn't done nine, so I'm good, you know, I'm, I'm stuck at eight and a half. And in her profound wisdom, she said, huh, and walked off. That's all she said, huh. What she knew was that one of the promises is that we can look the world in the eye, and I could not look the world in the eye. I could look my cuticles in the eye. I could look the styrofoam cup in the eye. I could look everything in the eye except you. Then I think I'm on eight and a half, and the truth is I'm so close to a drink I can taste it. And I 
moment of desperation, I asked that woman to be my sponsor, and luckily, she was about to move. Um, and the only reason I say luckily was we only had a short period of time to get through the book. And we did. And we did it like my life depended upon it. And today I know that's because it did. I was too arrogant to think so at the time, but I know that it did. And when we went through the book, when we came to a step, we took it. We just read, and when we came to a step, we took it. And that's how I take the ladies that I sponsor through the, through the steps. Um, so when I got to the fourth step, well, we said the third step prayer on our knees, and uh, which was so weird. Um, we were at her apartment, and she... She had, like, all the blinds were open, the door was open. Like, God or anybody could see right in. And she put down <laughs> she put down three pillows, one for me, one for her, and one for God. <laughs> and, um, like he had bad knees or something. And I am mortified by this whole thing. I am mortified by this whole thing because I know what's coming. My other sponsor didn't make it do that publicly. She just sent me home to read it. But this woman's going to want to hold my hands and say that prayer and anybody walking past could just see what was going on in there and think we were some kind of Jesus freaks. And Oh, I forgot to mention, before I took a drink, I wanted to be a minister when I grew up. Um... Oops. And so now I'm wigged out by saying a prayer in AA. Um, but we got on our knees, we said the prayer, we held hands, and halfway through the prayer I began to cry, and I couldn't tell you why, except something began to happen. A friend of mine talks about it creating the sacred triangle, and I think that's what happens. It's a, it's a sponsor, a sponsor, and God. And all I know is that when I've had all three of those things going on in my life, um, I haven't had to drink over anything. But uh, we got done with that prayer, and, you know, there's a little drunk traps throughout this literature. And, um, and it says right after that prayer, we thought well before taking this step. And I said, we did not. <laughs> we did not. You just said read the prayer. Why did they put that after instead of before? And she started laughing and said, too bad, he's got it now. <laughs> and then she said, stay there. And she ran off to the bedroom like I was going to run out into the street, scream, well, that's a possibility, but I didn't. And she came out holding one of those um, spiral notebooks and one of those big pins that you guys used to snort cocaine through. And... Um, <laughs> Two things that stood out to me about that moment. The notebook was orange, not my favorite color. Uh, and the pen was cheap Bic. And I like nice pens. I like, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll work with a gel pen, but I really prefer a fountain pen for a document of this type. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. I wrote out my second step in calligraphy. <laughs> As soon as I see that orange notebook, I'm like, I'm going to have to decoupage the cover of that before we can even get started, because I know what's coming. And um, she says, this is your official four-step notebook, and here is your official four-step pen. And I'm looking at that pen like she's handed me a turd. Um, I'm thinking, that thing's not even going to make it to the car. And, um, and here's how I know I had the right sponsor. What she said was, and if perhaps you lose the official four-step pen, here are the guidelines. You may use one of the 400 pens you already own. You may borrow a pen that is sitting on the table in Alcoholics Anonymous. You can go to the bank and write with the pen on the chain. She really did say that. Um, what you may not do is go shopping for the proper pen with which to write your fourth step. And I'm thinking, how did she know? <laughs> so I got my official four-step notebook. I've got my official four-step pen. She let me borrow the official four-step ruler. I was not allowed to take that with me. It had a sharp edge. And, um, and so she, I drew lines on the paper where she told me to draw lines on the paper. And that's what I did for my first hour after I did the third-step prayer. 
Then she gave me instructions on how to write the grudge list. I love the grudge list. It is delightful. It is fantastic. It's the best part. Um, we didn't really work on any finesse moves on this inventory. She just said, write about everybody you hate. Just put three names down every night of somebody you hate. If you happen to come up with a few more, add them. But every night, make a commitment to write down three names. And so I did that, and it was delightful. It's just a reverse Christmas list. Like, just, and it just, I finally I figured out categories are delightful. Like him his ex-wife, his new wife, his, you know, his girlfriends, all that. I could go by zip codes. I could categorize by jobs, people I share DNA with. I mean, it just, it, it just flowed. I thought, what is the big deal about this? This is delightful. Um, so I get done with my grudge list, and I call her, and I say, I'm done with my grudge list. And she says, great, wait three days and call me back. You know, there's nothing that will freak a drunk out more than stop. I'm like, I'm not buying a handgun. I'm trying to finish this inventory, lady. So I call her back in three days, and she said, what happened? I said, I got 17 more names. She said, great, wait three days and call me back. So I wait three days, and she says, what happened? I said, I got four more names. She said, wait three days and call me back. And by the time I got down to there were no more names, she showed me how to do the next part. Um, I have a business right now that's called the Elephant Sandwich. Uh, I'm not promoting it. But it's called that because that's what my sponsor kept telling me about this inventory, that we do. An inventory is overwhelming, but we eat an elephant sandwich one bite at a time. And that's what I was doing. She was teaching me how to do an inventory one bite at a time. She didn't give me the whole instruction. She didn't say, it's in the book. I don't know why the three columns in the book are like kryptonite to the newcomer, but... And then we get the 12 and 12, and... And then somebody shows up with worksheets. Where did the worksheets come from? Nobody gave me a worksheet. And... um. We get all baffled by this stuff. And, uh, and what my sponsor did was she grabbed one of her notebooks. She pulled two pages out, and she handed me a page from her notebook. She didn't even look at it. Like, she, I didn't even know. Like, she didn't know who I was reading about. I could tell that it was somebody she slept with. And so she got these four columns. And, I mean, I am trying to memorize this thing like it's a CIA document. And she's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm memorizing it. She said, why? I said, so I can give you back your paper. She said, why? Now, wait a minute. See, I had heard these things like inventories are toxic waste. My first sponsor burned mine, you know. If you happen to keep your inventory, you got to have it in a secret, super secret, double locked thing, and you got to make arrangements so that if you die, some sponsee comes over, gets all your porn and your inventories <laughs> out of your house. Hmm. And, um, I mean, that's what I had been told. Like, this is super secret, top. You gotta, I mean, I don't really want. Actually, my husband has read more. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I don't, it's not something I want to wallpaper the world with. But when this woman gave me a page from her inventory, she didn't just tell me things were going to get different. She proved it. Because I said, what if I show this to somebody else? She said, I don't care. So what if I show it to your, your fiancé? She said, I don't care. What if I Xeroxed it? Put it on the cars of everybody at your home group. She said, I don't care. You see, I've worked all the steps on this, and it's been turned to good account. This information has no power over me at all. And I believed her. And I wanted that so desperately that I did what she told me to do. I wrote three columns. First, I wrote who. Then I wrote the cause. Then I wrote which areas of my life it affected. After I had finished the first three columns, I then moved to the fourth column. One of my pet peeves, I'm a semantics girl. I get caught up in words. And I hear in meetings all the time that the fourth step is my part. For me, it is very important that I call it something different because any time I'm talking about my part, I'm hanging on to the fact that you have a part. And I'm already starting ratios, and I'm probably at 23%. I don't, I like, I just started that and went, why did you pick 23? Because you can't do the math to figure out what the other part of that is. But 
you get what I'm saying. They got a bigger part than I got. And suddenly I'm already, before I've even written anything down, I'm negotiating on how much amends do I really owe instead of getting the information that I need to get from this inventory to move forward in my life. And so I get to that, um, I get to that fourth column and, and I look, where are my mistakes? Where was I to blame? Now, before I go any further, I'm going to do a completely goofy illustration of what the inventory really is to me, just in case there's somebody here who's freaking out about doing this. Really and truly, what it was like for me is that I've gone through my life, and I really like cereal, like I really like cereal. Like I, I've eaten cereal every day of my life pretty much, like forever. This is an analogy. I haven't really, but you can get the shape eating that much cereal. Anyway, so I'm eating all the cereal, 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 cereal. And, um, and the quirky thing about me is that I love to keep the boxes. Now, when I was a little kid, that was okay. My parents got me this little, you know, box box where I would save my boxes. And, um, and because I was a little kid, it was those little bitty boxes. And, but before you know it, that box gets filled up, and now I've got to have a cereal box closet. So I got the box in the closet, and that's okay. It's no problem. I mean, it's perfectly manageable. I mean, it's just a little quirky thing. I like the boxes. I eat the cereal, and we save them. And so um, on this goes, and now I've got boxes inside my oven and inside my fridge. They're under the bed. The whole dining room is now a box categorization categorized box place. And, um, and I'm just saying, if you got these kind of boxes, it's going to start kind of taking over. And, um, like you may miss work every now and then, um, because box management hasn't gone well and you have a box of lunch and things start falling and you got to figure out new places to put the boxes. And if you meet a nice man, like, it's really hard to invite him over because they open up the door and see the boxes, and they're like, whoa, hey there, um, I think we're good, little kiss at the door, I'm out. And um, and so I got this whole box situation, and I get sober, and, um, and everything's a lot better, um, except I still got the boxes. And um, and I got this sponsor that I'm calling every single day because that's what she told me to do. And um, But I'm not telling her nothing because she'll use it against me in a court of law or I'll probably have to do some writing or something. And um, But one day, accidentally, I got my sponsor on the phone and, uh, and she said, why were you late to the meeting? And I'm like, oh, the box. It was just the box thing. She was like, boxes? Y yeah. What kind of boxes? Cereal, cereal boxes. <laughs> Do you collect cereal boxes too? Wait a minute. You? I, and she says, I used to collect cereal boxes myself. Huh. What kind of cereal boxes you got? No, wait. Don't tell me. Let me guess. You, you only have three kinds, right? How does she know? You got resentment crispies? You got frosted Freddy flakes? <laughs> Getting lucky charms. <laughs> and I'm like, how does she know I got the three kinds of boxes? They're all over my freaking house. She's like, how many you got? I'm like, I don't know. She said, you really should count them. You really should count them. I counted mine. I know how many boxes I had. As a matter of fact, every now and then I slip back up and I get new boxes and I got to go back through them. She said, um, but I'm just going to tell you from experience, the boxes have no value. I'm like, but I have an extensive collection. I'm certain they'll be worth something someday. And she says, no, they are completely worthless. But you did get the prizes out, right? Prizes? Yeah, at the bottom of every box there's a prize. Shut up. I've been saving all these boxes. They're cluttering up my entire life. They decide where I can go, who I can hang with, who can come in my house, who can't come in my house, whether I get to go to work today or not. And there's prizes in them? And she says, yes. Let me help you. First, we're going to sort the boxes into piles. Then we're going to pull out the prizes. You'll find a lot of duplication. <laughs> But the cool thing is that once you get the prizes out, you can use those things moving forward. That's all an inventory is. 
It's just figuring out the life lessons that we missed because we were wasted. Um, and so what an inventory is is a way for my sponsor to find out what I don't know. That's it. It is not about guilt. It is not about shame. I thought the third part of this was the horometer. I was mortified. <laughs> That's not what it's about at all. So I get done writing those resentments, and I go back to my sponsor's house, and she shows me how to write a fear inventory. Um, the book says that... Um, Fear ought to be classed with stealing, and that's sort of my qualification on whether it belongs on my inventory or not. Some people start with spiders and snakes, and if that's where you're at, that's cool. Spiders and snakes have really not stolen from the quality of my life. Fear of success, fear of failure, fear, fear of not being lovable, fear of being defective. You know, it's kind of the same stuff. I mean, most of us share a lot of the same fears. Um, and what my book says is that, is that it's instincts gone awry. I'm like a bird that flies north for the winter. You know, um, I just, mine go the wrong direction and I'm in collision. And the problem is also that fear is driving me and I've got conflicting fears. I've got a fear of success and a fear of failure. I wonder why my life isn't going anywhere. I'm just doing donuts in the parking lot. I can't figure it out. And I'm certainly not driving the car. I'm certainly not making decisions by, by myself because fear is driving me. And so what my sponsor had me do was I wrote first a list of fears. And then on the, on the other side, she had me do it in two columns. And on this side, I wrote, how has, health, has self-reliance failed me? And what she said was, I want you to take a look at the behaviors that you have whenever you're in this fear. Because fear is so familiar to you, you're like a fish in water. It is very difficult for you to recognize fear. But maybe you can start seeing this weird stuff you do, and that'll give you a clue that you're in fear. Because we've got this really cool recipe that goes with fear. But if you don't know you're in it, it's really hard to apply it. So um, I write down the fear. Uh, fear of abandonment. One of, our, one of our favorites, top ten. Um, and uh, for what that looks like for me is I play a little game called Do You Love Me Now? You remember that commercial, Can You Hear Me Now? My version is called Do You Love Me Now? And uh, it goes a little bit like this. I like to test the people in my life to make sure they're not going anywhere. you got to know if they're a runner or a stayer. And here's the way that I do it. When we're first dating and, and everything's bubbly and giggly, every now and then I just, every now and then I just slide in, do you love me now? And he says, yes. And I go, ooh. And, um, and he passes that part. So then I start being just a little annoying. Do you love me now? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. Then you got to do some sort of surprise attack, sort of a little PMSy thing where you just start crying in public for no reason and turn on him like a wild animal. And right in the middle of it, you go, "Tell me now," and because um, anybody can pass the first two levels. Then you got the three in the morning surprise attack. Do you let me now? And um, call him at work. You know, leave notes, stalk him, make sure you know where he is. What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Do you let me now? What are you thinking about? What are you thinking about? Why did you, you used to call me three times a day? Now you only call me once every three days. Do you love me now? <laughs> Some of y'all are still running this test. And, um, and let me tell you, it's a hundred percent effective because sooner or later, I find the breaking point. Sooner or later, they go, nope, sure don't. I do not. Done. I don't know what you need, but it is not me, and I am out of here. And, uh, and now I have great information that is of absolutely no use to me because of the restraining order. Um... <laughs> And so I go through and I look at what I do when I'm in fear about money. I like to spend and gamble. Makes a lot of sense to an alkologic. You know, when you're, when you're driven by fear, that makes sense. And the fact that I've never won any real money by gambling doesn't seem to affect me much. <laughs> like if I'm super duper broke, I'll still think, got 60 bucks and Oklahoma's an hour and a half away. 
Bet you I could turn it into 6,000. I vaguely sensed I wasn't being any too smart, but here's the, what the other part of my brain says. It's never happened before. Today's your day, sister. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Today's your day. So I start doing this, and I start seeing what, I'm in, what I do when I'm in fear. And you don't have to have a PhD to see some jacked up stuff all by yourself. Don't even need a sponsor. Like, what in the Sam Hill was I thinking here? <laughs> and then I get to the paragraph in the book that says, perhaps there is a better way. <laughs> you think? <laughs> we try its infinite God rather than our finite selves. It says I got to recognize that fear. I got to acknowledge it. I got to offer it to God and ask him and then direct my attention, ask God to remove it, then direct my attention to what he would have me be. And then it says I, I commence to outgrow fear. It's one of my favorite promises in the book because I have been driven by fear forever and ever. Amen. And it's been making my decisions for me for as long before I drank. Fear was making my decisions for me. Fear was moving nine moves ahead so that I never got to join a team because what if someday the ball comes to me and I drop it so I can't be a part of the team? And what if someday I have this amazing story where I tried to learn to water ski sober. Oh. And um, what they did not know was I was never going to stand up. They did not know that. I was never going to stand up. And the reason I was never going to stand up is, I don't know what happens after you stand up. But the problem was, I was not verbalizing that, and I kept getting really close to standing up. And so the AAs wouldn't let me give up. And so I'd get just about this far, and I'd go, oh, no, and I'd let go. And they go, oh, man, one more time. I was crippled for three weeks after that, because the skis were just, and um, it was a tough weekend. Um, but there are so many things in my life where I was so close, but I was never going to stand up because I didn't know what came next. I didn't know what success would be like. I didn't know what real love would look like. I didn't know what it could be like if you trusted God. Like many women um, in Alcoholics Anonymous, when my heart got broken, I lowered my standards instead of raising them. And so we get to that sex inventory, and I am appalled with what I have to write down. Because as I said, I was, uh, was going to be a minister when I grew up. I prayed before I lost my virginity. I took that seriously. I believed in the commitment. I believed it was a covenant between me, God, and another human being. And, I, um, and then I began to trade it for beer and drugs. And uh, never on an official capacity, just hobby. And... Um, <laughs> Like, that matters. I don't know why that even, why did that even need to be said? Um, <laughs> puts the same dirty on you. <laughs> um, anyhow, so I, uh, <laughs> so I got to write this down, and I'm mortified. I am mortified about what I'm going to have to tell somebody else. The sheer number horrifies me, much less what I got to write. And, and here's the thing, it wasn't about who and when and where and what positions and how many wild animals were involved or any of that kind of stuff. That's the part we're afraid of, and that's not what we're talking about at all. What we're looking at is what do you not know? And in this area, I knew almost nothing. I knew almost nothing. And uh, my inventories from while I was drinking simply showed me that I, that I used um, my sexuality as currency. Um, but it didn't give me a lot of insight moving forward. Um, I had to do that in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and I began to date men in AA, and, and after each one I did an inventory. And, and what I discovered, um, there are some questions on page 69, and... Um, and I write six little boxes. The first one is who. I love that we start with the stumper. Um, <laughs> my sponsor said I could just put guy in the blue hat or whatever. But um, <laughs> where was I uh, selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? Again, with, with the bar arrangements, that's not such a big deal. But, but um, with the real relationships, that was pretty important. Um, especially so in, in sobriety, you know, I, I, 
in sobriety, I found myself agreeing to things that I weren't what I wanted, you know? I'd like a guy, he'd start flirting with me, and he'd say, well, you know, I just got divorced. And, I mean, I'm just not even sure the human beings are supposed to be monogamous. I mean, I just don't even know. <laughs> I'm certainly not ever getting married again, I'll tell you that much right here. And uh, I'm just kind of looking for somebody to kick it with. And... Uh, And here's what I would say. Me too! <laughs> Y'all, I have wanted to be married since I came out of the chute. I have wanted to be a wife. I wanted a veil. And, um, I mean, you know, I wanted the whole shebang. And uh, <laughs> this Easter, my husband, we're on the way to church, and he goes, Hey, my shirt matches your dress. I bought a shirt. Of course it matches my dress. Because I've been planning this since I was three. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but I'm I'm looking this guy dead in the eye and Alcoholics Anonymous going, well, good, I just want to... <laughs> and, uh... And what my... I, I got the two things. I got the two things. I got the... It, this is the only thing on the menu, you know? Socially in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's kind of like Wingstop. That's all they're offering, so I guess we're having wings, you know? It's not like there's all kinds of stuff being offered here. Um, but then I never ask for anything but wings. That's the reality. I never required more than wings. And the other part of it is, if I love you the way I love you, you will change your tune. You know how many people that worked on? <laughs> it's not for lack of trying, man. It is not for lack of trying. So I'm selfish, I'm dishonest, I'm inconsiderate. I'm consumed with self in this area. I'm completely insecure. I'm looking for my okay from the outside in. And I am bugging you at work, and I need your attention, and I don't care that you have a little kid. I've got things that I need from you right now. Whom did we harm? I'm, I'm not really into the group thing. It's weird enough one-on-one. -on -one. I thought there was just going to be two names there. I discovered that is absolutely incorrect. Sponsors, sponsees, home groups, jobs, all kinds of people were affected by this behavior because I do things at the speed of microwave, and I want you to be a part of my family and me to be a part of yours, and we're dragging those little kids into our relationship before we even know if we can get along, and it's not fair to anybody, and I don't like what I see in that little question right there. The next one is, were we selfish, dishonest, or no, did I uh, arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? I'm not really big on jealousy or suspicion. I am pretty focused. When I get one, I mean, I like my record is like seven years after the breakup, I was still in a relationship with him. <laughs> he moved away, married somebody else. I'm still writing love letters to him. I'm a little intense. Um, hmm. But I make up for it in bitterness. <laughs> Because uh, here's what happens. You know, little things start to nag at me. Just little things, just tiny things. I like to monitor the trash. I wonder how long he's going to let that trash be like that. Because I don't know if y'all know the unwritten law came down with Moses. Men take out the trash. And um, my sponsor don't know that, but really. So I start monitoring the trash. I don't say anything because that would be petty. <laughs> but I supervise it. Like I just, every day I make a little note. Oh, that's how far it is today. Oh, look, it's, okay, now it's level. It's just about time to take that old trash out. I do not know that there is some ingredient in testosterone that says, the game has just begun. <laughs> I'm from Texas, and I date men who dip, which adds a whole new element to the game, because there are spit cans in there. It's fantastic. And, uh, and I start supervising that thing and monitoring, monitoring, but I'm not going to say anything. I'm not that petty. It's not that big a deal. Then I start watching what's going on in the bathroom. Good Lord, man, come on now. So I'm watching that. I'm supervising that thing. Why do I always have to be the one who changes, puts the toilet paper out? Why? Why is that my job? You lose that game quick, girls, because they don't need it like we need it. <laughs> I don't know when they go or where they go, but they can go days without it. I cannot. And... Um, 
got the secret stash that he can't use because I gotta find out how long we can go. But I'm not gonna say anything about that. I'm spiritual. I'm spiritual. I love that man. Then we're at a restaurant, and you know, I'm right in the middle of one of my witty stories, and somebody young and perky comes by, and all of a sudden, oh no, he did not. <laughs> And suddenly I got this little Rolodex of behaviors, and I'm not married to a dumb man. And, and he goes, what? What's going on? What? What? What's the, what's the matter? What's the matter? And I don't want to ruin our dinner. So I say, nothing, dear. It's fine. But it goes in the Rolodex. And all of a sudden, one day, he comes home from work, and he's like, Ugh. He's like, look, I don't even want to do the, I don't know where do you want to, I don't know where I don't want to. So I'm just telling you, do you want Mexican or Chinese? And all of a sudden, my Rolodex goes, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? Is that how we're going to do it? And guys are so cute because they think this is about what just happened. <laughs> You are so precious. Because he's like, Italian's good. We could do Italian. What do you want to? He's throwing out different food types, and I am pulling out index cards like a ninja warrior. And in 1983, you were wearing a green shirt. Let me tell you what. He's trying to figure out the food. Um. And I have told him 23 times, nothing, fine, it's okay. And I whip that back out, and we're going to do the whole thing all at once. And I, that arouses the smidge of bitterness. <laughs> Thank goodness there's a step for that. Um, the next step is what, the next box is what should we have done instead. If you haven't done your inventory, I'm going to let you cheat off my paper. Um, two choices. One is slow down. We do stuff fast. We do stuff fast. And what I discovered in my inventory is one of the reasons I move so quickly is that i got to get you in my house and get you committed before there's any bad information coming to light. <laughs> now, when you say it out loud, that sounds insane. But it's what we do. It's what we, i got to hurry. i got to hurry. i got these little, little precious things that I sponsor now, and they love just sliding in on their 10-step. See the newcomer. They don't talk to their sponsor about it, just because I don't want anybody interfering with my bright idea. And you know, a sponsor's job is just to keep you from having any fun. That's what we do. We just ruin fun. <laughs> Except the truth is, I'm trying to keep you from hitting the potholes that I've hit over and over and over again. When you know where, where a pothole is that'll total your car, you kind of want to make sure that anybody that you can protect from it, you, you will. And that's what I discover is that I'm in this big hurry, so it's slow down or run like the wind. You know, I see these things, and I run, I drive right past them. I see these big red flags, and I run right past them. And um, so I get, and then the final question is, was it selfish or not? Then we get to the fifth step. And uh, I do not understand people who have written inventories and don't go immediately to the fifth step. I tell my sponsor I'm done with the inventory before I am. I mean, that's just the truth, so that I will create a deadline for myself because I've got to get this stuff out. It's like emptying the litter box and then driving around with that stuff in your car. Just, it's mine. <laughs> Y'all, it's hot. It smell bad. Other people know. Like, they know. You're not being slick with this whole, got my inventory. Just going to drive around with it in my car. Share it with your sponsor immediately. It says we pocket our pride and go to it. And so when I got to my sponsor's house, I've got this inventory written, and, um, and I've got this thing that I don't want to share. And uh, right before we get started, my sponsor did two things. The first was that she asked me why we do an inventory. And uh, I didn't know the answer. I'd been reading the book every day, and I didn't know the answer. Uh, so I made it up. Uh, the reason we do a first step is because fellowship of the Spirit and the sunlight and hand-in-hand <laughs> hand with the Spirit of the universe and the character defects. And uh, she just let me go. And uh, then she whipped out the book, and it said, best reason first, we might not overcome drinking. Okey-doke, might not overcome drinking. That seems important. Uh, the next thing 
was that she said a prayer, and I didn't want her to say a prayer because I had a secret I wasn't going to tell. And I don't know what she actually prayed, but I know what I heard. It was something like, God, please help Jennifer be honest. Because if she is not honest, she will drink and she will die a slow death. And, and it was just all about drinking and honest and dying and extended livers and just bad stuff. And, uh, and I start reading this inventory, and I do the first page, and I've got the secret, and I'm not going to tell. And I do the second page, and I tell a little bit about myself, and she tells a little bit about herself, and and nothing bad happens. Nothing bad happens. I'm just not going to tell. And I get to the third page, and it's on this guy, and uh, and I uh, I read it, and I'm like, this is a piece of cake. I'm just not going to tell the thing. That's just the thing is not going to be told. And uh, she asks me one question, one question and I fold like a cheap lawn chair. I immediately start just projectile weeping. Um, the inventory piece was on a guy who didn't 13 step me and I was profoundly disappointed um, because I'd seen some of his other selections and um, and my sponsor said, are you straight? Ah! I mean, I just start bawling and um, and she said, what's the matter? And I said, I don't know. And she said, well, why don't you ask God? And I said, what if he tells me the wrong thing? And she said, say that again. (laughs) And I said it again. And she said, say it louder. And I said, what if God tells me the wrong thing? And she said, how could God possibly tell you the wrong thing? What I had told her was I thought I was a lesbian that didn't like women. (laughs) And she did that. And, um... She asked if I had acted on that, and I was like, I'm not really sure how you do. And um, and when we went through it, then she whipped out the big book, and I said, Sister, it ain't in there. And she, she opened up to the book, and, and it says that, you know, alcohol can render some men impotent. I know it's never happened to any of y'all, but I got some firsthand experience with that. And uh, And she said, if it can happen with men, don't you think it can happen with women? Maybe alcohol has just shut you down. And I think it's important in your journey to find out who you are, what you are, and whose you are. And why don't you just ask God? And I said a prayer, and I did some writing, and I got an answer. And what my sponsor had told me all along was that whatever God told me was okay. If it was okay with me, God, and my sponsor, it was okay with everybody. And I would never have to explain or defend it to anyone. So I did the prayer, and I did the writing, and I got my answer. And you may think you know the answer, or you may not. But I don't have to explain or defend it to anyone because it's okay with me, God, and my sponsor. That's what the fifth step does with me. For a brief and shining moment, I know what's my job and what's God's job. I walk away with an overwhelming sense that it's just going to be okay when I didn't think it was going to be okay. And I find out that I'm neither as wonderful nor as terrible as I think I am which just might be a touch of humility. I'm glad to be here. It's a good day to be sober. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.